Hi, hello everyone. Um, welcome to this session of our NPTEL course, Appreciating Linguistics or Typological Approach. So, um, and now, now the concern is um, the above study which has been done uh, on English and Korean, what sort of uh, generalization we can draw. So, before that let us summarize what we have studied so far. So, the concern here is that the children who are acquiring Korean and English, they are sensitive to the spatial distinction of the ambient language. That means, a Korean child would automatically acquire the loose connection and close fit difference. A Korean child would not have to give special effort to identify that an apple and a cup, they are loosely connected, but a ring and uh, and let us say a cassette, they are close fit with each other. So, that is that is not a problem for the typologically a child, um, the children are sensitive to the spatial distinctions of the ambient language. Now, so then what is the question? The question is how do they acquire the, spa the space related terms or the spatial terms. And cross linguistically if you try to find out, then a couple of conditions can be noted as recurrent factors that shapes the language acquisition process across languages. And one such condition is the frequency of forms in the ambient language. If a particular word has been frequently occurring and it expo and it gives the exposure um, of uh, it gives the child the exposure and it facilitates facilitates the learning the child is going to acquire it faster. So, it depends on the frequency of that word. Second, the children show a preference for one to one relationship between form and meaning, right. If a word is polysemous that means for example, um, the word like bank or if the language has words whose meanings either overlap cake and pastry or are identical something like doctor and physician. So, in such cases it becomes difficult for the child. So, the, the one typological generalization is that the word which occurs frequently in the discourse, it is easier for child to acquire that. Second, the, ch the children irrespective of whatever language they are acquiring, they tend to go for a one to one mapping of the meaning. So, if there is a one to one mapping of the meaning um, of the meaning of the word, it becomes easier for child's acquisition. But what becomes a challenge? Uh, it becomes a challenge when the child encounters polysemous words like bank or if the language has um, overlapping meaning like cake and pastry, the meaning is overlapping. And if there are words which are identical and they are synonyms something like doctor and physician. So, in these cases it becomes difficult for the child. So, the child finds it a little tricky to zero in on the proper use of such words. So, irrespective of whatever might be the language be it English, be it Korean, be it Japanese, Hindi anything to acquire the special terms the first condition is that the frequency of such words should be more in the discourse. Second, if there is a one to one mapping it is easier for the child to pick it up. If there is a there is if the words are polysemous or if they are they are uh, they sound to be identical and if there is a overlapping in the meaning then it is difficult for the child. So, if you summarize the process of acquisition of spatial terms this is what we can uh, we can draw the generalization. So, look at the generalization 5. So, how what is the initial stage? What is the uh, intermediate stage? What is the final stage? And what are the conditions associated with it? Okay. So, the initial stage is that the children do not understand or use special terms, we will start from there, they do not understand. So, therefore, um, what happens? There is like it, there is no appearance uh, to be the inborn bias, either the containment versus support of the close fit versus loose fit, loose fit distinction. So, to begin with, at the initial stage, if they do not understand, so they do not they do not care whether it is uh, whether there is a loose fit or a close fit distinction, whether the words are loosely connected or closely connected does not matter because they just do not. So, uh, we assume that the initial stage the child or the children do not understand anything about the spatial terms. So, what happens? 
um, in the intermediate stage, the children they try to extend and possibly overextend words, but these extensions will stay within the basic categories of the ambient language. So, um, in the intermediate, so they started from 0 and in the intermediate stages what they did, they overextended the use of the word if it is in, on, over, close, far. So, they tried to relate all possible semantic overextensions with um, such spatially connected words. So, that is the intermediate stage. So, the zero use, zero understanding is the initial stage, overextension is the terminal sorry intermediate stage. And what is the final stage? The final stage is that the terms are understood and used in the ambient language. So, the language that they are using or they are speaking, they could finally understood all the terms related to the space. If it is Korean, they would think about loose connection, close fit, if it is English, does not really matter. So, it, it, it only focuses on the adpositions in English, but in Korean they have to distinguish and it happens automatically to a child, to a Korean speaking child, it happens automatically. The child can e easily figure out how, uh, whether the objects are loosely connected or they are close fit. And if it is happening um, in the close connection or loosely fit, uh, sorry uh, loosely connected, then the verb form would be different. If it is a close fit, there is no difference in the verb form. So, that is the final stage that the child acquires. And what are the conditions for which such things happen? There are two things. First, the frequency of exposure, right? And this frequency of exo exposure and then the bi unique relationship between the word form and the meaning. So, these are the two things which facilitate acquisition. If the child has enough uh, uh, exposure as far as the frequency of the term is concerned in the linguistic environment, that is one condition. The second condition, if the word has a one to one mapping of the meaning, then it will help the child to acquire that particular word faster. But if you have the polysemous words, overlapping semantics, identical words, then it is going to be difficult. So, cross linguistically we can draw this conclusion. Zero understanding, initial stage, overextension, intermediate stage, right understanding of the word and correct use in the ambient language is the final stage. And what are the conditions? Frequency of exposure and then the second one by unique relationship that means one to one word mapping that is going to facilitate the acquisition process of the child. Okay? So, um, now uh, with this I think we would uh, quickly just move to the uh, second language acquisition. Again I am not really going to discuss in detail, but I will just give you a brief idea how this was about the first language acquisition. When a child is trying to acquire words related to antonyms or for example, spatial sorry spatial terms. And now we are going to talk about the second language acquisition, but both the systems they have certain parallels, certain overlaps, also certain distinctness. So, the first distinctness um, that I want to highlight when it is second language acquisition is that unlike the first language acquisition, the learner has two systems in one head, right. So, why the, the task is a little complicated here? In case of the first language acquisition, the movement involves starting with no language and arriving at knowledge of a language from 0 to 1. That is why the child, ha the child has only one system in, in, its, in her head. But in case of second language acquisition, it involves adding a language to one's already existing experience, already existing linguistic experience. Did I make sense? Could you understand? In case of first language acquisition, the journey is from 0 to 1. The child did not have any language, if we assume, which is generativists would uh, not agree with that, or the child had something in it, but that is the language. Um, acquisition device if we can use the term here. So, it is the journey is from 0 to the knowledge of a language. So, there was no existing other language when the child acquired the first language. So, it is 0 to 1, but in case of the second language acquisition, the learner already has a system in the head. So, that is what the title should be two systems in one head. So, in, in such cases what sort of typological generalization we can draw as far as initial, intermediate and final stages are concerned. So, um, if you look at it, it might um, you might feel that oh these are very different things, 
but not really these are not as different as it looks nevertheless there are parallel between the two acquisition processes and what is the similarity the similarity is that in some like the, the, there could be discrepancy but then the linguistic in, input from the environment and then the one to one mapping as we have seen in the previous generalization that also or so things like that also have certain role to play right so in case of second language acquisition there is a problem and the problem is same as it is in the first language acquisition and what is that there is a discrepancy between the language input and the learners are exposed to so there is a there, like the input of the language and what the learner is expected to uh, learn there is a discrepancy and how they comprehended it and how they produce it so the competence in the performance if if i can say or the available input and the production so there is a discrepancy in both cases the available input in case of first language and the production of the first language the available input of the second language and then the production of the language so this process remains same in both cases whether it is first language acquisition or second language acquisition the journey might be from 0 to 1 but the input versus production that is remaining same so with this information let's see um, what actually happens in case of second language acquisition two uh, things or or if i can say basically um, yeah to begin it uh, to begin with the first two things we have to focus this and this then we'll go to this and this all right um, okay so maybe i'll not uh, i'll just circle it right so let's focus on the first two things what is happening what what is our expectation as a language learner so when you say second language learning um, we expect the production of the target language should be error free right and error free in comparison with what they have heard and nothing else should be considered here that means the a native speaker of the second language and the second language learners language should be exactly alike there should be replicas so that means there must not be any error um, in the learners speech that should be the ultimate output but what happens actually does it really happen in this way and we will see or we will check if typologically it is same no matter whatever language you are learning as a second language does it have um, does it have any discrepancy or typologically can be put it together or there are various categories that we will see as we understand it seems no matter whatever might be the language the cross linguistic generalization is almost similar so what happens let us look at the first two points the first point is the production is below the input and what does it say this says about the selectivity of the learner so what does the learner do the learners do not produce all that they have heard rather their production is selective of the input let us say there is there is some x number of inputs available okay so i'm going to write here x number of inputs so the number of inputs that's x but the learner selectively learned things so x minus 5 let's say this is the output the learners didn't select all of them rather the learner became selective and instead of producing all that they have heard what they did the, their production became selective this is one thing that happens in the language acquisition process the second language acquisition the other side of the story is this was this was production below the input now the second point look at this the production beyond the input okay so this is below this is beyond when it is below it is related to selectivity when it is beyond the input it is the creativity of the learner. So, what do the learners do? The learners not only produce what they have heard, they also produced by including novel forms. So, that becomes creativity. So, this is this thing will work in case of selectivity. And if x is input, x plus 5 is output if this is output then this is creativity 
Okay. So, these are the two things happening typologically, typologically the pattern is same here. No matter whatever second language you are learning, your uh, if your output is below what you have heard, that means you are selective in acquisition, selective in learning. If you are uh, your output is beyond what you have heard, that means you are creative in acquisition, like you have been a creative person. So, your production is x plus 5. In case of below, your production is x minus 5, right. So, let us uh, look at the first two, these two statements, then we will go to the next two points over here. So, what should be, what are the questions that you might have type uh, and I just said typologically this is true across cross linguistic reference. So, here is that how to account for the selective imitation and creativity. So, in one case the learner is selective, the other case the learner is creative. Do you think all languages they behave similarly as far as the selection and creation uh, selectivity and creativity is concerned. So, selectivity issue boils down to the order in which various aspects of the target language structure uh, are gradually observed by the learner. So, when you are talking about selection, the learner is targeting only selected structures. In case of creativity, this involves finding the sources of errors. And what the learners do? They deviate from the target language and uh, they note the changes in the deviant structure and they create their own constructions. So, selection involves or selection includes um, the grammatical aspects of the target language. Creation includes identification of errors, identification of the sources of errors and then the then the learner tries to deviate from the target language okay so this is how it is different in most of the cases um, as far as the second language acquisition is concerned so with this information let's move to the let's let's choose one point so on the basis of the selection and cre and selectivity and creativity um, and the what we want to consider here is accent all right so um, the way I speak English, my accent is different from a native speaker of English or a, or, an, or maybe a speaker who belongs to some other countries, um, but I have my own accent of English speaking. So, on in this connection, let us try to understand what happens when a person or like when a learner is trying to learn a particular language and whether accent as a linguistic tool does it help us to understand or to find out some cross linguistic generalization. So, uh, the very famous Russian linguist Roman Jakobson, he, um, he has, um, um, he, he was able to speak uh, six languages and all of them um, that is Russian, right. So, keeping into account or keeping in mind that a multilingual speaker that, that Jakobson would be or Jakobson was or for that matter any person who is a multilingual speaker what sort of uh, conditions or what sort of situations do we have when we are talking about the foreign accents. Let us say English is not really a foreign language to me, but it is a second language for an, for, for an average Indian, but my accent is going to reflect my attempt to uh, imitate the pronunciation of the target language. If I speak like almost like a native speaker, that means I have imitated it well. If I, if my accent has been different from the, the um, let us say um, standard English, the kind of English which is spoken um, in Britain or British or American English, then I would say that the my accent has been different. So, keeping in mind the issue of accents, let us see what the selectivity creativity says, right. Uh, the things like creativity and selectivity say in fact, I am going to put it in two separate units. So, what is the first point again selectivity which is related to below and creativity which is related to beyond right. So, if I am a select if if I am a selected learner like if if I am focusing on selectivity that means my input has been below the um, like sorry my production has been below the input. So, which is why my target language the accent at my accent of my target language is not exactly the way a native speaker will speak, right. So, my accent would be different from the native speaker's accent and why this happens it will be 
that means I have been selective in acquisition or in learning. So, what I produce and what sort of information that I have in the linguistic environment the word below is going to be used. So, that means I am not producing or I could not produce all that I have heard. All that I have heard from the native speakers or the way the native speakers speak I could not produce it all rather my production has been below the input that is why it will be a part of selectivity. In case of creativity the production is beyond the input. So, what, what happened uh, as far as my accent of English is concerned my pronunciation deviates from the phonology of the target language right. So, uh, and this deviation is going to be different so which is why it will be considered as Indian English because the, the kind of English that I speak is one particular variety. So, that is Indian English and I deviated from the phonology I deviated uh, from the inventory the phonological inventory that English has and I applied my creativity which is why my accent is Indian accent right. So, these are the and this is a cross linguistic pattern that you would find in almost all the languages be it English, be it Hindi, be it Odia, be it Chinese. So, across linguistically this is going to be the, the same thing and these hypotheses can be or these points can be considered um, for any given language in the, in the world as far as the second language acquisition is concerned. So, with this information let us move to the um, generalizations. So, just like we did it for um, the previous session when I was talking about the generalizations involving first language acquisition of antonyms. So, here we will see the second language acquisition based generalization. So, what is that at the initial stage a learner has? At the initial stage the learner does not have any knowledge of the phonological system of the target language. So, I do not know what is the phonological system and through the intermediate stage I started learning and finally, I started speaking like a native speaker. So, let us see what is written in the um, initial stage. Initial stage no knowledge of the phonological system. Intermediate stage both the order of acquisition and deviation from the target. Order of acquisition is related to the structure shared by L1 and L2. So, the if, if it is L1 and L2 both are acquired earlier in the course of learning L2. So, that means considering the person has already an L1 in the mind there are, remember I told there are two systems. So, the system of L1 was already there and during the intermediate stage the L2 has been acquired. Now, both the systems are simultaneously existing in the learners head. So, that is the intermediate stage right and because of the existence of both the things since the, the learner is handling both the systems at the same time there has there have been certain errors in the marked structures which shows that the 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 learner has a preference for the unmarked ones so the unmarked or the uh, yeah the unmarked structures are given preference and the marked ones have certain errors that means the specific grammatical structure of l2 seems to have certain errors so the error stage is the intermediate stage no language the initial stage a simultaneous acquisition and error states is the oh sorry simultaneous presence of L1 and L2 that is the intermediate stage. And what is the final stage? The final stage would be almost perfect or near perfect comprehension and production of the um, language system. If, if you could acquire that fluency and you are able to speak almost like a native speaker then it is going to be the final stage. And what are the conditions associated with it? there are many factors the fourth point is the condition and if I say there are many factors first the frequency of exposure as we have seen in the first language thing types of exposure learners motivation and attitude towards the L2. These four factors play equally important role to help the learner to learn a language basically the second language. So, in case of the first language we had only two factors one is frequency of exposure the second one is one to one mapping that is it. But in because one to one mapping will facilitate learning, but in case of second language acquisition there are more components added frequency type of exposure learners motivation 
and attitude, learner's attitude towards L2. If you really like the target language and you are uh, you, you have uh, you are motivated enough to learn it as quickly as possible, that will enhance your acquisition or your learning process, right. So, that is about um, language change and typology. So, I did not really focus much on the use issue, but I, I definitely talked about the um, diachrony related issues and then the development related issues. So, in case of diachrony, we did discuss how, how the articles have developed, how the word order has developed and how the ad position and noun phrases that condition has developed. And in case of uh, these are in the diachronic perspective and the synchronic level what sort of development? The first language acquisition that is also development, second language acquisition is also a development. In case of first language acquisition, the journey is from 0 to 1. In case of second language acquisition, it could be from 1 to 2. But what is same? The same, the what the similarity both the development stages have, um, uh, sorry, both the development stages have is that um, it is the input, the discrepancy between language input and language production. Be it first language acquisition or second language acquisition, this discrepancy has got to be there in both the cases, right. So, that is all about typology and language change that we have studied so far. My suggestion for you would be please go back and check the book that has been referred introducing language typology by Edith Moravsik published by Cambridge University Press and when you read you will find out more data and these concepts are going to be clearer to you, right. So, thank you. Um, I end the language change and typology section here and we will move to a new unit in the coming days. Thank you.